Okay, welcome into another edition of the Penn State Blitz. He's Greg Pickle. I'm Bob Flounders. Let's get that straight. Greg, a lot to get to. Spring practice right around the corner. We're going to talk about key questions on offense and on defense. A former Penn State recruiting verbal has a new home. You're going to talk about that. And we're going to close with a Penn State mailbag. <laughs> Okay, the Penn State Blitz podcast, another round, another round in March, Greg Pickle. I'm Bob Flounders. As, as I alluded to just a couple of seconds ago, Greg Pickle is with me in the studio. It's almost time for spring practice, so Greg, we're going to talk about key questions for the Lions on offense, on defense. We're going to get to a little recruiting news involving a former, sadly, Penn State verbal, and you know we're going to close with the Penn State mailbag. It's almost time for you to give... Uh, Give out your Kentucky Derby pick way ahead of time, so I'm gonna be. I might. I might ask you for that. But let's let's get into it. Uh, okay, Greg. So spring practice next week, right? Yeah. Right. It's gonna be great. Pro day also. Uh, anxious to see some of the former Lions work out for the scouts. But let's talk about <clears throat> Penn State's offense with the new OC, new offensive line coach, um, new receivers coach. Changes in the air. Yeah. They're re replacing some key players. Uh, some questions on offense that really kind of they, they need to answer. I mean, obviously, we always start with the obvious, you know, they're going to need some receivers to step up. We've talked about it in the last couple of weeks. Who are some candidates you're going to be watching? Yeah, I think when you look at that position group, Dwight Galt, you know, we've talked about Keandre Lambert a good bit. And yeah. Dwight Galt didn't really, uh, didn't really put a stop to that conversation by saying that he's one of the 12 true freshmen who's really kind of stood out during the first couple of months that that group's been on campus. So I think... When you look at the opportunity that's there for him, uh, it's, you know, the path to playing time is clear. Unless, you know, Cam Sullivan Brown, Daniel George made such tremendous uh, strides that, you know, they're that far ahead of Keandre Lambert. He's going to have a great shot to get on the field from the jump. So I'll be fascinated to watch that group. And then just as a whole, um, how does Kirk Shiraka maybe change the dynamic between yeah. quarterbacks and receivers? Does he do some different things to work on that chemistry and, you know, not. I think maybe you disagree, maybe you agree, but, you know, the receivers took a lot of flack last year with good reason, but maybe, uh, you know, Sean Clifford could have been better in some areas too. So I think Kirk Chirac is going to have to maybe fine-tune or tune up some things there. Um, mm. It's weird to say that spring practice is enormous for a team that's coming off another double-digit win season, a New Year's Six Bowl. You know, a lot of the times it's more routine than anything else, but... Mm -hmm. 15 practices, Bob, to try and get as much of this offense in as possible. It's going to be uh, paramount for them to make each practice count. Greg Pickle, how dare you talk about emerging young wideouts and not mention my guy, John Dunmore? How dare you? I wanted you to do it. How dare you? Well, yeah. I'm not letting you get away with it. He's my guy to watch uh, in the receiver group. We should probably mention, uh, as he enters his third year, Jahan Dotson should be the key guy, I yep. think, in the receiver group. Anxious to see what Kirk and, and Taylor Stubblefield can do with him. And you talked about um, the receivers and maybe some of the problems were with the quarterbacks, not just the receivers. I think it's fair to point out, I, I remember uh, James talking about, he wants to get the passing game and the quarterbacks mm -hmm. to use the whole field. Remember he talked about that, yep. uh, I think it was last month. He said, you know, they, they haven't really spread the ball around to, enough to his liking. He said Trace did a good job with that. I think when when Joe Moorhead was here, but they've kind of gotten away from it. It was largely just KJ Hamler mm -hmm. and Fryer Muth yep. and, and Jahan Dotson. But there's there you know usually there are three receivers on the field, mm -hmm. and they really didn't get it. They didn't really do enough maybe to use the that third guy. I think that's going to be a priority in spring. I'm sure James will talk about it, um, and I'm sure that's one of the things that uh, Kirk has on his list. Uh, and it's, and and I, I'm a little curious to see. Um, the second tight end, who it's going to be, um, you know, is it going to be, is it going to be Zach Kuntz? Is it going to be, you know, one of the, what, is it Theo Johnson? Is it, is it somebody else? Um, is it um, Brenton Strange, who mm -hmm. Dwight Galt said has added significant weight and now looks more like a tight end? They really, James really liked the two tight end set with Nick Bowers and Friday Muth last year. <clears throat> it's important. <laughs> you can't really put a guy out there unless he's ready to play. I right. think they want to, I think they want to use more of the two tight end sets. So let's see who is going to be the tight end that emerges. You never know. Hopefully it'll be – it could be Koontz, but, I mean, 
they they will play young players right away if they're ready. So I think it's going to be a big spring for the young guys. Yeah, when you talk about questions related to that position, I do wonder how much or if Theo Johnson will be full strength. He had a shoulder issue yeah. down at the Under Armour All-American game. You would like to think that three months later he'll be A-OK -okay to be 100% for spring practice, but we just don't know that information yet. Right. So that'll be something to watch. But, yeah, Bretton Strange, I believe he got a shot-out from Dwight Gall, too. And he's a guy who, in very limited time last year, sort of indicated, you know, you could kind of tell that he was maybe uh, being groomed to be that number two tight end this year. I think what Kirk Scirocco does with Coons will be fascinating, too. Clearly, some of the guys he had at Minnesota were big-bodied receivers, which Coons can be. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe he works more in that kind of a role as opposed to the true tight end role. We'll have to see what they decide to do. Okay, let's flip the script. Let's talk defense. Penn State's going to be very fast on defense, but they're also replacing a potential first-round pick in Etor Gross Matos. They got a little bonus when Shaka Tony decided to stay. I think that really kind of enhanced what they're doing at the defensive end group. Um, they have some really talented young linebackers that might push for playing time uh, along with to, to go with the All-American Micah Parsons. But I think I think if we're going to talk about key questions on defense, I think we got to start with the secondary. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, this <clears> is a group, Bob, that <throat> you would think Lamont Wade's penciled in for a starting spot. Right. Tariq at safety, Tariq Castro at field, same deal at corner. Mm -hmm. But... Which of those young guys made the biggest move between now and March? And right. which one of them will make the biggest move between, or I'm sorry, January and now? Sure. And then, you know, now in the end of spring practice, the, the middle of April, you know, which one of those guys really, or guy, you know, is it Keaton Ellis? Is it Joey Porter Jr.? Is it Trent Gordon? Is it Marquise Wilson? You got which, them all. Which one steps up or which two step up and really take control of not only the second starting yeah. cornerback spot replacing John Reed, mm -hmm. but also that nickel spot yeah. that we've seen a couple of guys DBs float a lot. into as well. Right. So, uh, and then in safety, you know, Jaquan Brisker seems like the natural fit there, but I think he's going to get pushed by some young guys too. Tyler Rudolph being maybe the yeah. one that's most interesting to watch at this point. Yeah, and I, 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 st I think he can play, but I mean, he's so valuable on special teams. Jonathan Sutherland mm -hmm. is a guy that I know P Penn State really values because of what he brings to the special teams. He was the captain uh, last year of that unit. Uh, Nick Scott toiled on special teams for a while and then had a breakout late in his career at safety, ended up getting drafted. I, I wouldn't count him out either. I think he's a player that can help. He's, he did some nice things uh, two years ago in a reserve role, but I, I do think Dwight Galt mentioned Jaquan Brisker. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think on paper it looks like it's going to be J Jaquan and Lamont Wade, but you, you just never know. We didn't really know at this time last year about Lamont Wade's ascension. He was, you know, he flirted with the transfer portal. He came back. They praised him in spring, but you still didn't know if he was going to be the starter. It turns out he was going to be. So um, I, I do think, I think youth, youth development is going to be very critical, especially at, at the cornerbacks. I'm really fascinated to see with what Joey Porter uh, Jr. can do. That He was the one kid they redshirted. They played Keaton and they played Marquise. Yep. Marquise had the big interception late in the Cotton Bowl. I know they like him, but it's it's a young group. But I think that's just the way college football is. I mean, your, your corners, more often than not, you're, you're not going to have a lot of fifth-year guys at corner. If they're good, they're going to leave for the league early. Um, so I think moving forward, Penn State's always going to be breaking in new corners. Um, you look how they do it at Ohio State. They're ready to roll right away, and Penn State needs to get kind of into that mode as well. That's, that's the next step I think the corners uh, have to take. Let's talk a little bit about defensive tackle real quick. Yeah. And also... Uh, the linebacker room. I, I think on paper, I think it's it's safe to say that uh, Ellis Brooks is probably the guy to beat out in the middle. He was he backed up Jan Johnson, who's moved on. A little more interesting is what who's going to be Cam Brown's replacement. I, I think there's a, a couple of really talented contenders. Two of them second year linebackers in, in Brandon Smith and Lance Dixon. Really exciting to see how it all shakes out. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch. I still wonder if they'll toil at all with moving Micah to the middle. And I know we talked recently, I think last week, about what that could mean and why him staying outside yeah. would be a more natural fit. But I do wonder if the best way to get as much of that talent on the field as possible might be to do that and then use Smith and Dixon around him or as a combination of a couple other guys. So we'll see. It's one thing that they have to consider. But I don't think there's questions there about how good that group can be. There's mm -hmm. questions, I think, just about who will right. be manning the positions. Defensive tackle, especially the two deep, maybe a different story, Bob. You know, you bring back Antonio Shelton, you bring back P.J. Mustafer. You should feel pretty good about those guys. Mm -hmm. But after them, uh, there's a lot of questions to answer. John Scott Jr. <clears throat> certainly has plenty to figure out during his first spring practice. Yeah, I think P.J. Mustafer is poised for a big year. I'd yeah. be surprised if he doesn't really b develop into one of the better uh, defensive tackles, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Big Ten. 
Uh, I think Antonio Shelton is underrated in a lot of aspects. He's a real key to that run defense that was so stout last year. The strongest player on the team, he just benched like 900 pounds right. last week. So he's, I think he's a, he didn't play in the Minnesota game, and it kind of hurt them a little bit. I think he's really a key player on the team. Backups are the key. A guy, I think a guy that might finally be ready 100% off the knee injury is Fred Hansard. I think sure. if he takes a step forward, that'll go a long way towards – building the depth that they need. I still don't know what to say about Damian Barber. Um, you know, he's a guy that we thought was going to be a little bit better last year. It didn't happen. Harrisburg high grad. Um, I don't know if he is in the in the top four. I think he's going to get pushed. And yeah. I think this is a make or break year for Damian. No question about it. You're listening to the Penn State Blitz podcast. You can find it wherever you get your audio, Apple, Spotify, anything in between. And you can find it on Penn Live, of course. Be sure to check right. it out. Each Thursday, though, I believe we might post it a little bit early this week. We'll have to wait and see if it all Mark works Pines, out. Mark Pines, he just keeps us guessing. We never know. That's right. We just, then, want, we just wait for it. To, I anxiously await to see it, and I never know when it's going to be ready. Shout out, Mark. That's right. And then the Penn State Blitz video, which if you're watching us, you might notice some new graphics, Bob. That's our <laughs> fancy new green screen in action. So a shout out to our guys here for getting that ready. Find it at YouTube.com slash All Penn State. Let's talk to some rec- recruiting. Yeah. And if you're going to rate us, I get five stars, he gets four. Just, I don't just even, so, just four so can be generous. Just so we're clear. I'm the five star, he's the four star. Speaking of five stars and four stars, Whoa. did you see what I did? Oh, brutal. Okay, Greg, <laughs> Penn, State, Penn State lost a verbal commit, a tight end from Florida. Yes. Uh, a little while ago. It's not a big class, but that tight end now has a new home. That's right. Nick Elksness commits to Florida, which is pretty much what everyone expected would happen after the Jacksonville uh, three-star class of 2021 tight end. Decommitted from Penn State now two Sundays ago, so no real shock there. I think the question, though, a lot of Penn State fans are asking, especially in light of Wyatt Millam, the four-star offensive tackle from West Virginia, picking West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they had a relationship there with Jarrett Parker, along with a lot of other coaches uh, for the Mountaineers. But there's a lot of panic I'm sensing at this point. We talked a little bit about it last week in the sense that Penn State now has two class of 2021 I can name Nate Bruce, Liam Clifford. There you go. Good job, Bob. Um, and there's a lot of concern from some folks that say, okay, Ohio State has 10. Some of these other top schools What if have they only have three kids in the class on signing day? Right, yeah. What a disaster it could be. I look at it as, again, your top targets are still out there for the most part. Um, until that changes, there's no real reason to panic. But mm-hmm. the same I'm not time, panicking. the same time, Penn State better have a good spring as yeah. it relates to hosting kids. Sure. And, you know, I, I don't want to equate the, uh, the seriousness of the coronavirus with, recruiting but you know they put out Penn State put out a statement on Monday night Mm -hmm. saying that they're reviewing all of large events that are scheduled for Mm -hmm. University Park and that you know obviously the blue-white game is among that along with academic conferences and some other things and so I will be interested to see if as the university researches that and decides what to do in the best interest of the students Mm -hmm. the fans everybody else if Penn State maybe doesn't try and get some guys on campus earlier during spring practice just in case you know, public health needs right. decide that they can't have the blue-white game, which is always the biggest visit week into the spring. So I think that's something to watch. Mm-hmm. Once spring practice begins, are they shifting some schedules around and trying to get some guys in earlier just in case that 15 practice ends up being closed to the public? So that's something to watch. All right. You know what time it is now. It's time for the mailbag. Hit me. All right. Um, I had a great question in mind, and now I can't remember what it is. So how old are you? Know, you're still in your 20s, man. Yeah, you gotta, you, you, I got to get you, it it's together. It's too early for this. You, you have to... Just focus a little. Focus. Um, looking at Pro Day next week, are you overly interested in seeing KJ Hamler run, or do you think that at this point <laughs> he's kind of yeah, yeah? Like, do you think he's in good shape at this point, or does he need the run to stay in that first round conversation? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the combine was like two, three weeks ago. At this point, yeah. Yep. Um, I don't. I wasn't. Sh- I couldn't really gauge how the severity of the injury at right. the time. It is key for him to run. If he does run, um, I, he's, he, I think he's only going to run if he's 100%. Mm-hmm. He's not going to He's not going to go at 90%. There's no point in doing that. His game tape speaks for himself. I mean, he's on the board, I think, at Penn State at 427 or some, something yes, ridiculous. Yep. ridiculous. I think that would be the highlight of the pro day is if he runs and, you know, if he could put up uh, an incredible number. I believe Etor did not, Etor did not run. Yep. In Indianapolis, if he runs, I think that would kind of be interesting because I think he's on the board in, in the high four sixes, right. if I'm not mistaken. If he can run low four six at 265 pounds, that's yeah. going to help him. Yep. 
Um, I might be more excited to see Yitor run than KJ, but I think KJ, with, if with KJ runs, the possibility of a, of a mid 4 2 time is, is, would, would, would be pretty neat. Yeah. And if he does run very well, KJ won't be shy about right. in, in the interviews. He's yes. always an interesting guy. I hope he runs well, but you know, I don't think he's going to push it if the hamstring's yeah. not. Yeah, not keep there. in mind Haluva Hall is a bit of a fast track because of the way it goes downhill a little bit. So that would be another good opportunity. You know, the scouts, of course, take that into consideration, <laughs> but he could post a super time. I did remember my question. All right. Going good, back, I was going to was going to burn it. In, Proud of you. Was going to burn it in the second segment. And I figured it'd be better served for the mailbag. Love Penn it. States. Defense being called one of the best in the country heading into spring practice. You know, there's some rankings out there that think they could be a top five, a top yeah. three unit in the country. Right or wrong that Penn State, are the questions maybe being glossed over at this point? Or do you think this unit truly will, uh, maybe by the middle of October, be one of the top five defenses in the country? I think they got to earn it. I think they will absolutely be a very, very good run defense. I think they were statistically number one at yeah. the end of the year. And a lot of that was... Guys like Shelton, Etor was a good run player, and the linebackers, obviously, Micah was tremendous. And right. I don't, I don't see that changing. If anything, they're going to be more athletic, maybe in the front seven. It comes down to the, it comes down to the pass defense. I thought that down the stretch, I mean, we saw the Cotton Bowl, we saw the game against Indiana. They were yeah. just not very good. There were, there were, there were some issues at times against Ohio State, Minnesota. The pass defense just. You know, the RPOs and, and the corners just got, got, and safeties got toasted on a regular basis. If they want to be a top five defense, they have to be more consistent. Um, they, have to, they have to limit yards after the catch, which is, I thought was, a, was an issue. They have to limit um, coverage busts, which was a problem. They're going to face, uh, you know, there's going to be a couple offenses that are going to be talented, obviously, and they just need to play better. I think the young corners have a chance um, to really upgrade unit it's going to be up to you know it's going to be up to uh brent prize guys as assistant coaches to get to coach them up the safeties i think can get a little better too the key to penn state's defense i think taking the next step is going to be pass defense and i think it really i really i think i think it falls to the corners and the safeties do you have any questions for me are we good to go uh i have a lot of questions for you but um they're not necessarily penn state related so <laughs> i'm not going to ask them but uh I, I, at some point i would like a kentucky derby pick from you. I'll, I'll lean audible at the I'll moment. I'll give you, you yeah. have four weeks to deliver me a, a, your Kentucky Derby pick. Um, it's not necessarily a Penn State theme thing. I did want to say, uh, uh, you know, this is a little bit off topic. I enjoy talking with Adam Brenneman, yeah, uh, the, right, former, yes. the former Penn State tight end, who's now, excuse me, he's, a, he's, a, he's an offensive grad assistant at Arizona State, mm -hmm. coaching for Herm Edwards. Marvin Lewis is on that staff, the former Bengals head coach. Adam made the decision to kind of, he had been in politics the last couple of years. Uh, he made it, he, he had missed, I think, football. I think he missed the competitive aspect of it. His career got cut short. Went on to become an All-American at UMass. Now he's out in the 75, 80 degree weather yeah, not a bad uh, place at to Tempe, be. Arizona, living living in the vacation house of his former UMass coach, Mark Whipple. I thought that was funny. But it's a big step for him. Um, he said he leaned on James Franklin for some advice about whether he, he should do it and how he should do it. So this is a, I think this is a, this is a big step for Adam. I think he's, he's looking at this as maybe a long-term thing. But, you know, if you're going to be, as you know, you, you know the Penn State grad assistants. If you're going to be a grad assistant, you have to be ready to grind. They're going right. to be some long hours. You, you start at the bottom. you got to work your way up. And hopefully he could embrace that. And who knows, maybe a couple years we'll be talking about him in another capacity. Yeah, what do you think his long-term outlook is at this point? Do you have a good read on whether he wants to get in the coordinator someday? <laughs> or is it just kind of a let's get in the door and yeah, see what happens? Yeah, I, I think he's just, I think he's starting at the bottom. He's, gonna, he's just trying to learn as much as he can in the next year or two. And he's obviously a sharp guy. He knows that he's coaching the tight ends, so I think that he can really lend some value to the Arizona State, you know, uh, coaching staff. He also said, you know, he was going through the list of things he has to do during the day, and it starts early, obviously, with staff meetings and scheduling practice, and then then they have practice, and then the whole staff watches the practice, and just when you think you're done, then you got to recruit. Right. And that's you know that's you know when that's what that's when the the eight to ten hour day moves into the you know twelve to fourteen hour day, but right. it's probably the most critical thing you're going to do um, he's got to he's going to have to learn how to do that I think I think I think we'll see I think we'll know more about how he's doing in the next year or two I think this year though it's just going to be about getting his feet wet and and he's going to be doing a lot of grunt work but if you got to do a lot of grunt work and you got a lot if you're going to work long days why not in Tempe Arizona right. 
Um, lots of nice scenery out there. I'm sure he's going to enjoy it. No doubt. The first former Penn Live Penn State video <laughs> team member to uh, enter the college football coaching ranks. And not the last. And not the last. So we'll be back talking spring uh, players that each you and I have picked out that we want to watch on the Penn State Blitz podcast. Right. That video will be separate and on YouTube.com slash all Penn State. One quick reminder if folks didn't see it, Brent Pry is going to be the keynote speaker Ooh. at Penn Live's High School Sports Award Banquet at the end of May. Beautiful. You can go to our website, pennlive.com slash Penn State Football. Look for the story on that and how to get tickets. He'll be here in, uh, in late May, and uh, we'll be right back. Mm-hmm.